Craig part two here, Electric Boogaloo. So we're going to, um, yeah, I don't know if anyone got that right. It's pretty lame. But anyways, uh, so again, I'm a pretty big thief. Uh, most of the material was stolen from uh, Kathleen Jennings, Josh Curtis, and then another colleague of ours, Corey Pong down south. So again, if you don't like it, it's not my fault it's there. So uh, blame them. So uh, we're going to talk about shoreline cleanup. We just got done hearing about on water cleanup. So at, fir at first, I went from you know we're protecting we're protecting shoreline from getting oiled. Well, now it's actually oiled. What do we do? So I'm going to go over some uh, response to cleanup goals. I'm going to go through this pretty fast. If you have any questions, you know, ra raise your hand. I'm, I'm hungry too. So uh, yeah, let's get out of here as quick as possible. So uh, we're going to talk about the cleanup strategy selection process, uh, some different cleanup techniques, then summarize and see it, then see if we can draw any conclusions. Um, probably can. So, anyways, what are some of the goals and response goals of response and cleanup? Well, first thing is always safety. Keep the public and the workers safe. That is always uh, priority number one in any in any cleanup and in any response you go to is safety. Safety first. Um, second of all, well, not second, but the second thing I'll go over is uh, to minimize the impact and enhance environmental recovery. That's why we're out there cleaning stuff up, is so the environment so the environment can be impacted for as little time as possible and recover as quickly as possible. And then um, should always keep this in mind, uh, environmental impacts can result from cleanup activities as well as the oil. They, they can uh, result from it, oftentimes they do. Uh, they do have, cleanup activities do impact the resources you're actually trying to protect, so keep that in mind. Uh, and you know, the sort of our, um, God, these slides are terrible. Um, so, so the rule we're gonna we're gonna sort of live by is don't it's do no more harm than good. Um, it's, I'm gonna just read this real quick. It's often the best cleanup strategy is not the one that removes the most oil, but removes oil that poses a greater threat of injury than the cleanup activity itself. I mean, you you can go out there and try to clean up every speck of oil you absolutely can. At some point in time you're going to start doing harm to the environment. You know, you get, you oil, you know, you oil a rock, you try to, you get all the oil off the rock and that, that and it invariably leaves the stain. You can blast that rock and get the stain off of there. Did you really accomplish anything by blasting that rock to a million little pieces? I don't know. I mean, that's, so those are sort of the things you have to go by. And, you know, and so that means sometimes you allow the remaining oil to be taken care of uh, by Mother Nature. She will do it. It's just generally not in the time frame that uh, that you know the public and the politica is find acceptable. So, some of the things to be taken into consideration are uh, what type of oil is it? I mean, is it uh, is it gasoline? Is it diesel, kerosene, or is it some heavy bunker uh, bunker crude or asphalt? Uh, is it actually on water? Is it on shore? Well, we're talking about onshore stuff, so I don't know why I put that in there. Uh, so, what type of shoreline is it? I mean, are you cleaning up rock, rocky shoreline here, or is it um, is it long stretch of sandy beach? Is it a wetland? That's going to dictate what type of cleanup method you're going to use. Uh, what are some of the logistical constraints? California has an awful lot of coastline. It's very much of the coastline you can't even access, and if you can't access, it's pretty diff it's pretty difficult. So, what can we actually do out there? That that'll really dictate um, what is done, you know what what is done, and also the presence uh, presence or absence of T and E species and the and the habitat. There's T and E species out there at certain times of year. You might not be able to clean it up, clean it up till after they leave. So, so some to always keep keep in the back of your mind. And all of this comes by the recommendation of the planning unit and, and, some, of the, and some of the ops people. And, the planning, and by planning, I mean SCAT, the shoreline cleanup and assessment teams. And after lunch, we're gonna, uh, Mike's going to talk, uh, talk about SCAT, what it is and what it does. I'll just mention them here, but they're the ones who come up with the cleanup <coughs> recommendations. Initially, uh, the first day of a spill, the cleanup, a lot of times the ops guys, they have oodles and oodles of experience. We'll go out there and you know we'll clean we'll clean up the most readily accessible stuff, but uh, for for the most part it's going to come from scat. 
And also, again, last but not least, personal safety. Is it even safe to clean up out there? During Costco, Busan, there were, there were pocket beaches uh, that, weren't safe, that weren't safe to clean up. I mean, the wave activity was too high. It was too difficult to get to. Can't clean it up. It was left out there. You go out there today, you know, is it five, six years later? Not going to find any oil. photographs of individuals repelling one yeah, that was all outside, uh, all, all outside of the command, and they went and went rogue. So uh, yeah, so they they took uh, they took their safety they took their safety in their up to their own hands. But yeah, it just wasn't going to be. I've seen those pictures too. It just wasn't going to be safe to send clean up to yeah. yeah SWAT cat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, Jordan, I think went over this yesterday. Um, about the different types of oil. Again, I'll just mention it here that not all oil is created equal. Um, what is actually spilled out there is going to really dictate how you clean it up. How you clean up, um, you know, diesel fuel versus how you clean up tar and asphalt. Two completely different things. Just know about it. One's, one's really persistent, one's not. Um, yeah, so Jordan's the expert, expert on that, so I won't go into any more detail. Um, I basically just like this, uh, like this slide. I like the mushroom cloud there. But so some of the different techniques that we use. Um, really, the first one, the one that's really widely used a lot, is natural recovery, no action. Let mother, mother, mother nature clean up, clean up the mess. Um, sometimes that's actually that's called for, but everybody signs off on that and they say it's okay. But there's passive collection, manual removal, flushing. Um, We'll, go, we'll touch on some of the stuff. Uh, vacuuming, you already heard, you already heard about that. Um, burning, uh, shoreline cleaning, H bioremediation. I'll, I'll touch on that because uh, there are going to be talks, you know, within the next couple of days that are going to hit that stuff specifically. So natural recovery. When do we do this? Well, if there's a sensitive habitat. Uh, the ESI talk, uh, it was mentioned about oil getting in wetlands. I mean, it happens. It happened during Costco Busan. What do you do sometimes? It's best to just leave it there. If you try to clean it up, you're just going to pound it down into the soil. You're a problem that you know Mother Nature take a couple of years to, to clean up, or you know maybe even months is now going to be there for decades. It's, da it's going to be down down in the mud, and you know it's not it's just not going to break down. So you're making you're actually making the problem worse. Uh, safety and safety and logistics. Again, we ju we just talked about that. Is it even safe to send somebody down there? I mean. It sucks to say it, but it's, not, it's just oil. It's not worth anybody's life to go down there and you know, you know, try to repel down there. You break your neck, or you know, have somebody, you know, God forbid, die down there trying to clean up a couple of gallons of oil. It's just not worth. It's just not worth it. And also, high energy environments. Um, again, this Mother Nature doing its work, but uh, in a more act, in a more active way. There's not a lot of high energy in wetlands. Out here, rocky shores, coasts, you get wave action all the time. Beats up the oil, breaks it up. Um, again, there's there's usually a safety component with that as well. Uh, passive collection, as Chris mentioned, uh, you have boom out here. Um, this actually is sort of a misnomer. It does take an awful lot of work. People do have to set set that stuff out initially, and also the, and also this uh, pom poms and sweep are collected uh, periodically, depending how much. Uh, how much product is actually is actually in the water? Um, we already mentioned absorbency. There's Randy. He's back. He's back there too. It's a pretty cool picture. I like it. But uh, but yeah, we are, uh, Chris already mentioned absorbent adsorbents. Um, yeah, they're awesome. You see you see it all around. I mean, this is what you see most often. And you go out to any marina any day of the week, you'll generally see you know uh, sausage boom out there. Um, or some sorbent pads, some diapers out there. Somebody pumped a bilge, so you know, fuel had a little fuel leak or something. You'll see, you'll see that out there quite, quite often. Uh, manual removal again, you know, um, th this is actually what you see uh, on the bigger spills. You see this an, an awful lot. You know, guys out there with their shovels picking up, shoveling up the oil. Um, a lot of times, it's dictated by uh, by access. You know, you can't get heavy equipment down to the beach or whatever. You just send a bunch of uh, work crews out there, pick it up, and sometimes they come up with pretty cool stuff. This is just a garden roller, and I think they had just like cellophane out there since oil has a high affinity for itself. They went out there instead of going going out there with like a pooper scooper and getting each little tar ball. They just had a garden roller and picked it and picked it all up. Uh, 
pretty nifty, pretty nifty little invention. Uh, again, manual removal, riprap scraping. Um, you see, you see it uh, quite often out here in the bay. That's a, a, an awful lot of our shoreline is riprap. Uh, flushing. Um, you know, this is this is generally used in rocky in rocky environments. You get oil out in the crevices. Pretty difficult for even manual removal to go down there and scrape it. So, if the oil is still, um, if it hasn't weathered too too much, it can be mobilized by sending um, by sending streams of water down there. And then you have a collection area out there, and they're able they're able to either skim it up or they put sorbent material out there. So here's more flushing. Uh, something to be noted out here, this is from the Exxon Valdez, the pressure washing. Uh, this is the do no more harm than good. They got all the oil. It be, actually became a sterile environment. It's uh, this high pre They used high pressure, hot water. They sterilized it. Nothing grows out there. Um, all, this, this was during the Costco we saw. This is out by Point Isabel. Go out there. There's there's all there's all there's all kinds of algae and cool little things out here out here nothing came back so um, you you always want to you, you get all the oil but at what price and again vegetation removal um, this is just like essentially the theory is just like mowing your lawn uh, you clip the tops the oil, the oil the oil parts of it then it uh, reduces exposure to wildlife other people uh, you don't have a, a persistent sheen out there within you know, depending on what time of year, you know, what could be a couple of weeks, could be a couple of months, uh, it all grows back just like new, just like mowing your, just like mowing your lawn. And then uh, my favorite thing to burn. Uh, I just like to see, I just like to, you know, throw a match out there and let it burn. But uh, you, you know, it doesn't happen very often. There's a lot, there's a lot of things that actually have to line up. You have, it has to be the correct day. Uh, you have to have the right temperature, wind speed. It has to be an approved burn day by their resource board. Um, you have to have, you know, uh, unified command buy off. There was actually, um, you know, in the Kinder Morgan spill in 2004. Um, all the agencies, everything lined up. It was okay to burn. They didn't end up burning because, um, if you guys are familiar with the Susu Marsh, it's all peat out there, and peat will uh, peat can burn underground. And it it was right next to a train track. They were scared of uh, scared of the fire actually burning underground and jumping and jumping the tracks. So uh, they decided they decided not to burn out there. But it is an alternative, and I think uh, Ellen's probably going to touch on this in the next couple of days in our alternative response technology uh, talk. <coughs> so just more manual removal stuff. Uh, vacuum recovery, Chris went over that. Trenching went over that. Shoreline cleaning agents, again, I'll just touch on it. Ellen, Ellen will go into more detail, but it is something that we use um, sort of like a dispersant, but uh, on, on rocks, uh, there's an approved list. Again, Ellen will go through all the details. I just wanted to mention it here that it is an option. So bioremediation, actually Kathleen's going to give a talk on this tomorrow. Uh, just, I'm just going to touch on it. It's uh, more of a polishing tool, not a primary cleanup tool. Uh, so again, Kinder Morgan, we're mentioning them an awful lot today. But uh, you know, this is out in the Sisu Marsh. This is the area that was affected uh, before bioremediation, after. Um, so you know, but you go out there now, lots of cool stuff is, is grown, uh, got rid of. All the oil out there, it's uh, good. It's good as new. So, but Kathleen will give you all the details and all the fun little tidbits. Skimmer types went over those. Skimming, yay, fun. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the, sort of the cleanup summary. Um, when you spill oil, it often ends up on shore. When it ends up on shore, what are we going to do about it? Uh, the cleanup strategy employed is generally determined by the scat and take into consideration the shoreline type, uh, oil type, volume, access, all that. Uh, well, I, didn't, I didn't touch on this too much, and I think Chris mentioned it. It can generate a large amount of oily waste. Um, we, try to minimize the, we try to minimize that because that is also an environmental consideration, how much waste you're producing. So um, you saw the picture with all the diapers thrown out to clean that machine. Yeah, that's something you know we, je we definitely which would try not to approve. Um, a lot of these things are very labor intensive. It takes an awful lot of time and cleanup costs skyrocket. So we try to look for, we try to always get the most bang for our buck. 
And uh, cleanup is usually a combination of response strategies. Again, California's coastline is pretty varied. You're not going to get a one, you know, um, just manual removal all, you know, the whole time. It's going to be a combination of everything. And uh, again, cleanup may cause additional environmental injury. I think Jordan's going to talk about uh, endpoint cleanup endpoints and go over that. But it's something to always keep in mind is that when you're out there cleaning stuff up, you're actually in, you could actually be injuring the environment at the same time. And also, um, I think it was brought up in the last talk, just a little bit of the amount of spilled may actually be recovered. So um, you spill 100 gallons doesn't mean you're actually going to pick up 100 gallons. There's a lot of other forces at work there. So something else to keep in mind. So in conclusion, uh, this is actually supposed to be an hospital. You can't really see it that well. Um, prevention is actually the preferred option. So with, any, with that, is there any questions?